Hello everyone, and welcome to this, the first episode of this podcast, which we are calling Getting to Better Together. It's being presented by the Centre for International Development, Social Entrepreneurship and Leadership. In one acronym, SIDSL. <laughs> we are a unit within the University of the Sunshine Coast. My name is Richard Borden, and I will be your host for this mini-series on which we focus on our belief that we citizens must assume much greater direct responsibility for creating better futures. Better futures for ourselves, for our children, our grandchildren, and for the constantly changing and challenging world about us. In a phrase, citizenship, we believe, is equal to participation, is equal to democracy. In this series, we will be as concerned with exploring how we all actually get to better together, as citizens, as institutions, as bodies, governments, corporations, and so on, as why we think this is critical. Given that all that's happening around us at the moment, locally, nationally, globally, we believe that this quest for betterment is as necessary as it is urgent. Furthermore, as conditions are in constant flux, we need to focus on the continuous process of getting better. We can never actually get there. So this is a journey. We have major concerns about threats to our democratic way of life and to the processes of democracy itself. Regrettably, as citizens, we have become less and less involved in decisions that are being taken in the name of what is better for us without our collective voices really being heard and recognising, of course, that the collective voice contains many differences. There are different voices, all of which need to be heard. So we ask, what are we going to do about all of this? And this will be the central theme of this series. We will combine presentations with informal talks, interviews with forums, questions and answer sessions, and maybe even citizen juries and assemblies. And this will all be conducted in ways that encourage participation from all who share our vision for getting to better together. We recognise that this task will not be easy in a climate where there is already so much talking. Social media, mainstream press, so on and so forth. In this, there is so much cynicism, scepticism and denialism. There are so many claims of hoaxes, of fake news, conspiracy theories, disinformation, misinformation and alternative facts. We want to cut through all of that noise. Why are we hosting this series? Well, in the first place, in our centre, we focus on development. Sadly, that word has uh, an unfortunate baggage, has images of draining the swamp, which means destroying wetlands. The image of high-rise buildings, of beaches being privatised, and so on. But development at base simply means better. It means more mature, it means more adaptable, flexible. It's not growth. Growth is simply bigger. We measure growth. In terms of betterment, however, we use judgment. Our brief then is to engage with society. And engagement is the least well-known function of universities. We're certainly best known for teaching and research. We are analysts. We seek to explain how the world works. We gain new knowledge through our research, which is seeking evidence to support the explanations that we develop, sometimes called theories, sometimes called hypotheses. But they are explanations which will hold up for the moment and which we seek evidence to support. So we measure stuff. And then when we teach, what we do is we share what we know. 
and we here means collectively. But it's important to recognise that, as academics, we're specialists. Our whole careers really depend on single disciplines in the sciences, in the social sciences, or the humanities. As scientists like me in the natural sciences, we're not particularly good on values, if at all. Now, that doesn't mean to say that as an individual, I don't have values. Of course, I do. But as a scientist, I am supposedly working value-free. I seek information, knowledge, evidence to support the explanations that I'm promoting. Now, this process of science and analysis, of course, has had brilliant success over at least the last century and a half. We are where we are as a population in huge gratitude for what scientists have exposed, of how the research has led to knowledge, and knowledge has been translated into technologies. So we, in essence, support the idea of research and teaching as our two fundamental functions. But there's more to life's decisions than expert technical knowledge. So science alone can't do it, as it were, can't help us deal with the complex issues that we're facing. We have values, we have intuitions, we have knowledge, we have moods. Hopefully, we have wisdom. But that's as citizens working together where we have huge differences in all of those. And what we need to do is to surface those differences in order to be able to move forward together, as it were. It was about 20 years ago now that an American scholar called Ernest Boyer came up with the belief that universities, particularly in the United States, where he was from, should take engagement more seriously. This would become the third part of a trinity, teaching, research, and engagement. In his words, universities needed to become much more vigorous partners with society, helping to resolve the most pressing social, civic, economic, and moral problems of the day. It's interesting he made no mention of ecological, or political, or psychological. Nevertheless, he did identify that this should be a major role of universities helping its communities to resolve these pressing issues. And there's certainly no shortage of these. In fact, they're so serious and so pervasive that we can adequately call them crises. Just think about them. Bushfires, pandemics, economic recession, environmental degradation, political upheavals, and perhaps the most significant challenge into the future, climate change. In this series, we're not going to dwell on all of these bads as bads. What we want to try and do is to understand them better in order that collectively we can improve, we can get to better, and we want to do that together. Of all of those crises, there are a number of characteristics that they have in common. First of all, they're all mixed up. They're not social or civic or economic or moral. They're all of that and more. They are, as a French philosopher once said, all mixed up, culture and nature together, all day, every day. They are dynamic. They demand urgent attention. They're messy. Well, they're deadly. They are unpredictable. They create uncertainty. Most of all, they are complex. Let me take a little digression here to make the distinction between complicated and complex, which are often used interchangeably. But they mean quite different things. Complicated means lots of different parts, but in the end, a predictable behaviour of how those parts come together. Let's take the example of a car, for instance, which has many moving parts, and in a modern car, has at least 50 computerised functions. 
But when something goes wrong with a car, the problem can be diagnosed and solutions found. Complicated, yes, but resolvable, solvable, also yes. Now, the moment you put a driver behind the wheel, what was complicated now all of a sudden becomes complex. Who knows what the driver is going to do next? Yes, there are rules. and Yes, there are regulations. There are norms. But human beings are human beings. They have moods. They have tantrums. Who hasn't exposed driver who are angry? Who hasn't really themselves broken the law a teeny weeny bit by going faster than the speed limit? Who knows what's going to happen when there is a crash? And so on. This is complexity. Complexity is unpredictability. The tragedy is that as human beings, we don't like complexity. We don't deal with it very well at all, therefore. We're creatures of habit. We like certainty, predictability, normalcy and simplicity. Simple problems can be solved, as we just suggested, but complex messy issues cannot be solved or resolved, to use Boyer's words. It's better to approach them as situations that can be improved, that can be bettered, but really bettered through cooperation, through collaboration, through getting together. So the notion of improvement or betterment is itself complex. It's loaded with difficult questions. What constitutes better? Who decides? What criteria are used? What impacts need to be assessed? The triple bottom line is uh, commonly used these days as a framework. People, planet and profit as the three focuses for impact of any particular action, particularly in business. Who has to happen? Who has to act in order to make it happen? What knowledge is needed? What values need to prevail? And what are the sources of both? So the approach to complexity is itself complex, and therefore we need to understand, clarify complexity in its entirety. Let's take the current pandemic crisis raging across the world, the infamous COVID-19. The only simple thing about this situation is the virus itself. Everything else is incredibly complex, messy, deadly and dynamic. It's also unending. Just when we think we have it under control, it pops up somewhere else. And popping up is a simplistic way of thinking about how this virus is spreading through populations. 54 million cases to date across the world. 1.3 million deaths. This is an extremely serious crisis. And yet here we are with bated breath, waiting for a silver bullet to solve the problem. But COVID-19 is not a problem that can be solved. It's a very complex issue that exemplifies this churning up of nature and culture. A vaccine, successful though it may well be, still fails to address the complexity of the issue. Think about the impacts. Illness and death, loss of income, social dislocation, the failure of small businesses, of health services, of aged care services, the impact that it has on national exports, on budget deficits, on poverty and much more besides. Now science can tell us a lot about the virus. It can tell us a lot about what we should be doing to minimise the spread of infection. Wear masks, wash hands, socially distance, avoid crowds, don't travel. It suggests that the most effective way is to test, to trace and quarantine if we want to actually reduce the rate at which the infection spreads. Yet, to do all of that, to wear masks, to wash hands, to socially distance, to avoid crowds, all depends on human behaviour. 
and that, as we're suggesting, is unpredictable and therefore complex. So vaccination is still not enough. The issue still fails to address complex relationships among people, in other words, between people and other people, between people and institutions, and between people and nature. Getting to better, then, demands something more than or better than the triple bottom line. Rather than people, planet and profit, where profit often reigns supreme, we should be thinking quite differently. We should be thinking about ecological impacts, ethical and economic frameworks for making judgments. Now, the point to be made is that post-COVID-19 will not be the same as returning to normalcy. That's not even possible, even if it was desirable. Who amongst us wants to go back to a world of social and economic inequity, of human rights abuses, of pollution and ecological degeneration, of political ineptitude, of corruption, of injustice, of terrorism, of food insecurity, etc.? The point that we're making, not to dwell on all of these as the bads, but to recognise that we really need to get to better as we move into the future. And to do so, we're arguing, we need to develop better ways of getting to better. And our argument is that we need to do this together. Democracy, after all, means by the people and for the people. To this end, however, as citizens, we immediately find ourselves on the horns of a dilemma. So on the one hand, we want to have a much greater say in getting to better together but we have little experience in how to do that. We've long handed over our responsibility to others, others to make decisions about our affairs into the future, and therefore we've lost our skills at judgment in terms of these large, pressing issues, the crises of the day. We've ceded our abilities to make decisions to governments, to the agencies of government, to technology and science in general, and perhaps most significantly to the market and its corporate handmaidens. Yet ironically, we've got very little faith in most of these institutions, or those within them for that matter. There's the grave danger that disillusionment rules, the norms that we have been so used to because we have placed our trust in these institutions, are now fragile. Think about the issue of politicisation of institutions in countries like the United States. Now, all of this has led to a basic dilemma, which in turn has led to serious consequences on many different fronts. So many decisions are being made these days based on ideological grounds or on the demands of the market. So policy is being made too often on the run. Some of this is good. Some, on the other hand, is not. And some is downright dangerous, particularly as we have seen in relation to the pandemic. All of this has led to an increasing lack of trust in politicians and in experts. It's fostered civil disobedience and non-compliance, even to violent protest. Now, all of this, in the end, is a lack of attention to moral values. So there's a lot of talk about science-informed decisions, but equally we need moral, morality, ethical, aesthetic functions in relation to judgments. And without transformative change in all of this, we won't get to better At the moment, indications are it will get worse. And this is for no other reason than there's ever more complexity. And of course, this is not made any easier by the fact that our population continues to grow. Every day, there are more mouths to feed. 
more bodies to shelter and to keep safe and healthy, more and more feet to trample the earth and to draw down on its limited resources. And so this will continue for decades to come. Our current population of 7.8 billion is calculated to reach 10 billion over the next 30 years. That's a 25% increase. But to put that into context, it's a sobering thought that when my own grandfather was born, the population of the world was a mere 1.2 billion. When my father was born, it was 1.7 billion, a 50% increase. And when I was born at 2.3 billion, that meant over three generations, the population had doubled. But the next three generations, to my grandchildren, there has been a further tripling of the population. Just also, as an aside, my grandfather was in his 40s before the car was invented. And now we have one billion cars, if we include trucks and buses as well, on the roads. And this number is increasing exponentially. Amongst the significance of this in terms of impacts, in terms of, say, pollution and road accidents, deaths, cost of infrastructure, and so on, 15% of the total annual greenhouse gases that are emitted come from this 1 billion motor vehicles on the road. And this is a very significant contributor to global warming and to climate change. So here's a complex situation, if ever there was one. But again, it's being treated as a problem to be solved. Reduce emissions. Keep the temperature down to 1.5 degrees Celsius from what it was in the Industrial Revolution. To keep the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere below 450 parts per million. Well, that's already no longer possible. The point about climate change is that it represents extraordinarily complex interrelationships between nature, culture and the atmosphere. Now, science, of course, is incredibly important. It's through science we know about climate change, of course. But in order to be able to respond to its challenges, we need not just measurement, but judgment. Along with science, we need ethical values. Along with experience, we need thinking. And an underlying issue for all of this, of course, is the comprehensive lack of competencies of dealing with complexity. We typically don't learn about complexity at school, nor, for the most part, even at universities. We don't even learn much about the complex relationship between fact and values, or belief and assumptions. Our tendency always is to seek simplicity. There was a wonderful statement made by Oliver Wendell Holmes, who said, I seek simplicity on the other side of complexity. We work through complexity. We try to understand it in order to figure out what might be done to improve situations. Most of us have very little understanding of the contribution that these relationships have to what we can call our world views the way we view the world as individuals and as members of particular cultures. Nor do we have much appreciation of the role and significance of the worldviews that we do hold as individuals and as members of specific cultures. It's probably true that most of us don't even think about the fact that we have worldviews, let alone the impact that they have. Yet, as we shall explore in later episodes in this series, our personal and cultural worldview beliefs and assumptions are central to the ideas, opinions, facts and values, the decisions that we want to make that underpin the whole endeavour of getting to better together. We will argue that it's differences in worldview beliefs and assumptions that are at the base of the vast majority of our conflicts. These are conflicts, disagreements among ourselves, with our enemies, with our political opponents, and vitally with nature. Actually, with the rest of nature, for after all, we are part of nature, and that itself is a worldview. 
Any word ending in ism gives a strong hint of the fact that we have worldview beliefs. Here's a sample. Extremism, terrorism, denialism, futurism, liberalism, socialism, fascism, communism, populism, nationalism, scientism, sexism, atheism, atomism, capitalism. All of these words are actually concepts that reflect particular views of the way we think about the way society operates or should operate. All of them are essentially different ways of seeing the world about us, and they find expression in the particular behaviours in what we do. As a very, very vital expression, what we do in the world reflects how we see it. And if that's so, it follows that if we're to change what we want or need to do, we need to change the way we see it. And that's no small task when most of us don't even know how we see it. We're hoping that this podcast mini-series will be a contribution to this transformation, to this clarification of worldviews and how we might transform them to get to better. Well, I've covered a whole lot of territory in this introductory session, but that, of course, is what an introductory session is about. It's to give you some idea of what's to follow. We will revisit these issues often in upcoming episodes as we seek to engage in pursuit of getting to better together. We want to talk to as many as possible who, as we say, share our views of the importance of getting to better together. We will talk not just to politicians, at the local, federal levels. We'll also talk to business people. And most importantly, we want to talk to you all as citizens. Our next broadcast, our next episode, um, will be an a, a interview with Claire Moore. Claire was a federal ALP senator from 2002 to 2019. During her time, she was the Shadow Minister for International Development and therefore is well attuned to the notion of getting to better together. Let me leave you with the words of the American anthropologist, the late Margaret Mead. Never doubt, she said, the small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So for me, it's goodbye. Until next time.